All right. Good morning, everybody. Myself, Dr. Imanshu Mathur from Jaipur Rehab. And here we are for the most awaited, probably the most awaited uh, webinar of uh, these two, three months uh, of the lockdown and pandemic. Uh, we have received so many queries, uh, and I'm uh, pretty much proud and privileged enough to say that we have received queries and uh, uh, we can say uh, inquiries from across the boundaries as well, not only India. We have got inquiries from Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and a lot of other adjoining countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, many are like that. So we are expecting for a great day and a great webinar today. So here I welcome uh, Dr. James Schomburg, sir. Uh, it is a proud privilege for me uh, welcoming him here today. And uh, it gives me give, gives me an immense pleasure to introduce uh, him to you people. So uh, James sir is the owner of the Second Visit, that is an international clinical education company. He's also the director of Back in Motion, Campbelltown uh, Valley View, and uh, Mount uh, Baker in South Australia. He was awarded as the most inspiring doctor in the year 2017. Uh, he's also uh, had been the board member of the Australian Physiotherapy Association and remains very active member of the profession representing APA in many committees. He's a lecturer in orthopedic and sports medicine at the School of Medicine, University of Adelaide. He's uh, also the lecturer and clinical supervisor of the School of Physiotherapy for 11 years in the University of Southern Australia and uh, has been a great uh, guest lecturer in the School of Physiotherapy at Flinders University. So I'll not be taking much time of yours and I'll be hand over the, uh, handing over the session to James, sir. Sir, you're all there and this session I'm, is all I'm, yours. Yeah. Fantastic. Before before you go, I just want to check. Have you got my slides? Can everybody, can yes, you see yes, my slides? Yes. Great. Yes, Thank everybody you. Gets it. Great. Well, welcome everybody uh, from all parts of the world. That's fantastic. I hope you understand my accent, and I'm really looking forward to presenting. So, um, I really look forward to this, and I hope it uh, it goes as well as I, I hope so. So, without any ado, I'm going to start speaking, and uh, I look forward to uh, some time at the end for questions. So we're going to start with, uh, and thank you for Dr. Hamanchu for giving me such a warm welcome too. So I'm going to talk to you about two approaches, which some of you may be very aware of, some of you may not be aware of, and they are the current, what I would consider the best practice approaches to assessing and treating shoulder problems, and that is the Lewis and the Littlewood approaches. Jeremy Lewis, if you do not know him, he's a very famous physiotherapist from New Zealand who then did his master's in Australia and then went to the United Kingdom and is a senior lecturer and one of the major researchers in, in the world on shoulders. And I've had the privilege of being taught directly by Jeremy. Chris Littlewood is also one of the most eminent shoulder researchers in the world and is from the United Kingdom. And he has done an international tour and I had the privilege of actually um, working with Chris Littlewood and actually um, actually being involved with some of his work. So it's a, a fantastic uh, two people I'm going to talk about. Now, what I'm going to be first saying is you'll be very interested. Uh, having myself had the... Um, good fortune of teaching many times in India, and I hope one day perhaps in Nepal and uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan, and I hear you're also from Indonesia, is one of the biggest differences you'll start seeing when we apply evidence-based practice is simply this. There is a very little place for electrotherapy. So you will not see any mention of electrotherapy in this course for very good reason. The My role at the School of Medicine is to teach medical students, so not physiotherapy students, to teach doc, uh, training orthopedic surgeons. What is the current evidence for treating backs, treating shoulders, treating knees? And sadly, there is no evidence for electrotherapy. So that's the first thing I want to say is you won't be hearing it mentioned because there is no evidence for electrotherapy for shoulder problems except for calcific tendonitis, 
of which there is evidence that extracorporeal shockwave therapy has very good evidence. And in fact, is actually the treatment of choice. So that is the only time you will hear me talk about this. Now, this is a usually a four-hour presentation that I'm going to condense down to an hour. If there is enough interest, um, I can go into much more detail at another time, but that's, I guess, as a result of whether this has been a success or not. So I'm going to give you a very brief overview, and I'm going to flick through quite a few of these slides, because as I said, this is a this is part of a two-day course I run, and this is the first half of the first day, so it's a fit, usually a four-hour presentation. Really important to set the scene. What we need, what you what we need to understand is that shoulder pain is very persistent and it's one of the largest problems in the human body. 21 to 50% only. So only one in eight to one in two report full recovery with a shoulder pain if there is no management of it after six months. Very interesting too is if one to three years, depending on the study, 40 to 54% report ongoing pain. And as we speak right now, there is a point prevalence of shoulder pain of 26%. So one in four of you sitting here listening to this presentation will be suffering from shoulder problems as we speak. This is a point that Jeremy Lewis put forward, and I think it's a fascinating question. Now, it's one that's beyond the, the 45 minutes or time I have before I go to questions. Um, and But one of the things that I'd love to share with people in much more detail, and I think it's a fascinating topic, is, is it time we reframe how we care for patients with persistent musculoskeletal problems? Because it's very interesting, when you look at the research, whether somebody has Non, whether somebody is non-insulin dependent or has cardiovascular disease or has um, respiratory problems, then you will find, um, so such as obstructive airway disease, you will find there are similarities. And in fact, the treatments for them, for any of these, seem to be very similar. Um, and you could add the same in for all chronic or persistent musculoskeletal pain problems. All of these problems, weight loss. All of these problems, increased activity. You will find that that's a, and diet. All of those have a factor in all of those chronic conditions, even shoulders. There is research to show that people who are overweight suffer more from shoulder pain than those who don't. And it is not because they're carrying more weight in their shoulder. It is because they, as a result of this, adipose tissue, Adipose tissue produces a lot more cytokines. And so as a result, you, you raises the inflammation in the tissues. And these you're vulnerable to pain, therefore. And so all of these conditions have one common theme, persistence or chronicity. And in fact, whether you're an insulin, non-insulin dependent diabetic or whether you've got peripheral vascular disease from obesity or cardiovascular disease, or you have chronic pain, weight loss, gradual introduction of reactivity, are two of the mainstays of treatment. It's only then, there's usually one other part of the treatment that they need. They may need, obviously, insulin for diabetics. They may need um, an antihypertensive if they are suffering from cardiovascular disease. And for musculoskeletal problems, they may need specific exercise for that problem. So there's one common theme. That's that chronicity that um, Jeremy Lewis says we really should start treating chronic pain like any other chronic illness and that changes the way that people think about it there's very rarely a cure it is a process of management you can't cure diabetes by just taking a tablet you need to lose weight you need to if you can if you're lucky you need those other approaches it is exactly the same with chronic pain here's the interesting thing if you have to if a if a shoulder patient walks in the door in your practice, you have a two out of three chance that the problem is stemming from the rotator cuff. So if you're never sure, you've got a very high chance, no matter what you assess, no matter how you treat, that the problem's in the cuff. So what I want to explain is what is rotator cuff, what, it, what causes pain from the rotator cuff? Because we have so many terminologies which actually cause harm. And the one that 
is becoming more and more prevalent in research and being encouraged by experts in the field is we should be using the terms such as rotator cuff tendinopathy. It doesn't create fear in the patient and fear is one of our primary drivers of pain. It's credible for the patient. The patient accepts it because they understand the more I use it, the more I load my shoulder, the worse it gets. So it fits with their way of thinking. And it's really important that it needs to make sense to the patient without creating more fear. Words like tear, words like bursitis can really create undue fear and aren't necessary. Really, we should be using the term rotator cuff tendinopathy for all of those problems. And I will go through uh, in a moment what those terms are. I will, anatomy, we, we will have to move on from. But I, one of the things I do want to talk about, I'll just put here as part of therapy, if you can remember just one little simple thing, is our shoulders, because of our position of our glenoids with the joint, is our shoulders are designed to work less than 90 degrees. So as soon as we get above here, we're not designed for optimal throwing. We aren't monkeys. We aren't gorillas. So we aren't designed for hanging. We're not designed for brachiating. Their glenoids are that way orientated versus ours are this way orientated. And that's and so as a result, we are optimally functioning at less than 90 degrees. So one of the keys for all your management for shoulder problems is if you see a person who has to work above 90 degrees, ask yourself this, what can I do with the ergonomics to reduce their movement to be under 90 degrees? How can I get that shoulder under 90 degrees when they work? So if they're doing hair up here all day, or as a barber or a hairdresser, maybe they could stand on a platform to get them to work at a lower position of their shoulders. If they're a painter, rather than using a brush, maybe they need a large roller with an extension. Anything to get them to work under 90 degrees where it's possible is critical. Again, I'm not going to go through the anatomy. But I will, the one, there's some key points I want to go through though. The rotator cuff isn't distinct. If you anatomically try and look at it through dissection, you'll find that the tendons fuse to form a common insertion on the humeral tuberosity. So it isn't a specific tendon. They all coalesce. And it's really important to understand that. So when you put pressure in one part of the cuff, you impart pressure on the others. And just like a suspension bridge, as it's written here, the cable, rotated cable, is the thing that's critical. It connects one side of the bridge to the other, and it carries load from one to the other. And that is a godsend because when you have a tear in one of the tendons, you as long as you have the cable intact, as long as the rest of the muscles are intact, you are able to produce still a very functional shoulder, even with a tear. Also very important is not one test isolates individual components of the sling. So when we do our empty can and our full can tests, they're very useful for working out if it's a rotator cough problem. However, they have no validity in saying, oh, it's supraspinatus or it's infraspinatus or it's teres minor or it's subscapularis because you're imparting load across the whole complex. So really important to understand that. I'm flicking through because of time. Just if we go through some key points, the bursi in the, in the, in the shoulder, understand that there's six to 12. We often think of a subacromial as the critical one here, but there are many others. But really important to understand is the suprascapular nerve coming up from behind the scapula and the lateral pectoral nerves supply the rotator cuff muscles and the bursi. And they all arise from, if you remember your anatomy, from the C5 and 6 nerve roots. So what does it mean? It means that you can get pain to and from your neck. If you ever have a shoulder problem, you will hear when I was, I actually had the absolute privilege of being taught by Jeffrey Maitland. Jeffrey Maitland was one of my lecturers when I did my master's in sports and musculoskeletal physiotherapy. His rule always was treat the spine first. 
if you have shoulder problems. Now, he wasn't sure why. This was long before the research. Now, the research shows really good validity that the cervical spine is commonly implicated with shoulder problems because of this, the, the um, referral to and from the neck. So whenever you see a shoulder problem, let's go back, remember to work below 90 degrees. Remember to always examine and assess the neck because it may be really important. How do you know it's effective? How do you know that the neck is actually contributing to their pain experience with the shoulder? Is really simple. And it's you test a movement that is functionally a problem, you treat the neck, and then you reassess after. Let me give you an example. Let's say the biggest problem with a patient is putting their arm up to reach, which is a common problem with the shoulder. And that's their biggest limit. They're struggling to get up there because of pain in their shoulder. And you want to see if their neck is involved. Then you would treat the neck, usually C5 to C, expect that referral pattern. You'll often find joint changes in those facet joints on the side, on the same side. However you treat the facet joints, whether it's manipulation, whether it's Maitland mobilization, whether it's mulligan approach, um, mobilizations with mo movement, it doesn't matter. More importantly is that you treat those affected levels if they are positive, if you find joint signs, and you say to the patient, look, I'm going to see if your neck is involved. I'm going to treat these joints, and then we're going to reassess your shoulder, your, most, your worst movement, your most provocative movement. So you treat those joints, let's say with this make the mobilization, and then you reassess their shoulder movement. Now, if that has changed, it is a very powerful positive for your patient, and you can be very confident that the cervical spine is at least partially the source, unlikely to be the total source, but partially contributing to their pain experience. So let's go to the bursting in more detail. It's really important to understand about bursting. And Jeremy Lewis's studies from last year and, and the year before uh, are fascinating in this because he's actually done biopsies of them. Multiple substances may stimulate nociception and contribute to pain experience. Now, we know that from lots of recent studies. Neuropeptides, especially substance P, is a sensitizer in, of the nervous system and, in, and basically desensitizes the dorsal horn and actually causes a greater amount of nociception. Now, they, substance P is very high in swollen bursi, as are cytokines, which are pro-inflammatory. And I've got some examples there, interleukin-18 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. You've also got your COX-2, COX-1 COX and 2 enzymes, which are pro-inflammatory. And this is why anti-inflammatory therapy often can help because anti-inflammatory therapy, non-steroidals, are COX-2 inhibitors. So it reduces the amount of those enzymes which are pro-inflammatory. And the interesting, all those chemicals that I've listed above aren't present in normal healthy bursa, but in bursi, which are contributing to the pain experience, they are. I won't go through a coracoid ligament because of time. Don't forget, again, we talked about the joints of the cervical spine, but don't forget that we also have to look at the cervical muscles because any muscle which attaches to the scapula is going to have a direct impact on both not, not just the cervical spine biomechanics, but also the shoulder. Levator scapula is a commonly overactive muscle with shoulder problems, particularly with cuff, when you're trying to elevate the uh, rib, sorry, elevate the rib, elevate the scapula. When you're unable to do that because of cuff problems, you substitute using this. And as we know from your anatomy, the vatus scapula attaches particularly to the facet joints of the upper cervical spine. Now there's other attachments to the mastoid process. If you look here into the C12, C23, and C34, but C23 is its major attack. Now the C23 is a classic joint to cause headaches. C23 headaches commonly are behind the eye. And so when you see a patient with shoulder problems, make sure you check A, their history of neck pain, and B, if they're suffering from headaches. Now, if they have developed headaches since their shoulder has occurred, it is often indicated that the levator scapula is becoming overactive. So you must test the length of the levator scapula, and you may need to address levator scapula length as well if 
there is a headache associated with their shoulder pain. Upper trabesius is also associated with uh, headaches, but a different headache. Memory your anatomy attaches to ligamentum nuchae and also along the occiput. And because of attachment around the occiput, it often compresses the O1, the Atlanta occipital joint, which will often give you a different type of headache. O1 headaches tend to be over the side of the head into the temple. So again, make sure when you have a shoulder problem, you ask about neck pain and headaches. And if they suffer from headaches, make sure you check length of upper trapezius and the later scapula. <clears throat> Excuse me. The deep neck flexors are absolutely critical too. Now, we know from a lot of research that deep neck flexors are critical for shoulder prob uh, neck problems. But there's also some really interesting research which has shown there's association between reduced upper neck flexion control and shoulder pain. Now, we don't know if what we call it in English, the chicken or the egg. That is, is the upper deep neck flexor control reduced and that predisposes you to shoulder pain? Or does shoulder pain actually reduce the ability for the upper neck muscles to switch on? We don't know. We don't know that research yet. But what we do know is that it occurs that there is a problem with upper neck flexion control and shoulder pain. There is a correlation. And what we also know is when we restore that function, when we improve the craniocervical flexion test with rehabilitation, we improve shoulder function. So that's a really important point. If you've got somebody with persistent shoulder problems, you should be checking for the for upper cervical spine control and understand that when you improve control in the neck, you often improve the shoulder. Also, we need to look consider the lumbopelvic hip, that's LPH, lumbopelvic hip control. We know with recurrent subacromial impingement, one of the rotator cuff pathologies, there is a strong link with poor lumbopelvic hip control. Why? There are a lot of reasons, but let's just go through one example. We know the research particularly says if you have poor, if you've got a problem, for example, with the left shoulder, you are much more likely to have a problem with the right side of your back and vice versa. Right shoulder, left side of your back. Why? We actually have, if you have a back, pre existing back problem, we know from a lot of research, no matter what the injury with the back, that the lumbar multifidus, LMF, switches off because of pain inhibition. And it is, does not reinitiate activity when you become painless. So you are already vulnerable to more back problems. But the back body will do whatever it has to do to give you stability in your trunk. So if your multifidus is firing, is not firing as it should, and not giving you that posterior shear force that is very protective for your lumbar spine, then other muscles will come into play to do that. And one of the primary muscles that will do that is a more superficial muscle, particularly one of them is latissimus dorsi. Now, latissimus dorsi is a very important muscle for the lumbar spine to control extension and rotation. So particularly with runners, <coughs> excuse me. So if, if you have low back pain, multifidus is not firing up properly, latissimus dorsi has a tendency to become overactive. When it becomes overactive, because it's primarily a phasic muscle, unlike the multifidus, which is tonic, and able to maintain low load, latissimus dorsi can't maintain contraction for long periods. So it fatigues, it shortens. Of course, latissimus dorsi, by its attachments to the tuberosity in the shoulder, if it shortens, it will increase your internal rotation. So that will leave you more vulnerable Internally rotated shoulder leaves you more vulnerable to subacromial impingement. So you have to look beyond, look at the neck, look at the thoracic spine, I haven't even talked about yet, but also look at the lumbar spine when you're dealing with shoulders because of the control. But also, very importantly, the shoulder has a really important, sorry, the shoulder is really, the strength is absolutely governed by your trunk. If you have a poor, poorly controlled trunk, we, you're unable to generate a huge amount of power, for example, with a serve. And so what happens is you have to rely much more on your cuff. The stronger your trunk is, the less load on the, on the cuff. So it's really important to address 
trunk control. And for example, as I've written here, 54% of a tennis serve comes from your legs and your trunk. So you need to look at the whole body. You can't just look at shoulders when you rehabilitate. Look at the neck, look at the thorax, look at the lumbar spine, look at the lower limbs. Because if you can't generate load in your lower limbs and your trunk, you have to do it elsewhere. And that's when the cuff gets overloaded. And we need trunk lateral flexion to let, when we throw, we go into side bending. You need strength, so it's really important. One of the great exercises is with a kettlebell and actually get them to drop their, um, is to actually use a kettlebell and, and work on lateral flexion control. Whilst the, so with one arm, while they're, throw, while they're pretending to throw with the other arm, so going to lateral flexion with the trunk while they're actually doing throwing action. How do we assess shoulders? Psychosocial factors, which I'll talk about briefly in a moment, are probably the one most important. Referred pain from the neck, I've talked about C5, 6 particularly, but you should look C4 to 7. The thoracic spine, T1 to 5, that can refer directly into the shoulder because of the sympathetic nervous system. Be aware that also you may be dealing with right side shoulder pain, it may be a red flag condition, such as a gallbladder. On the left side, it might be a spleen. We want to make sure it's not a frozen shoulder. Now, frozen shoulder is a completely different conversation than one out of today's topic. It's too big a topic, but it's rare in athletes, but it's common in the more older people or if they've got associated comorbidities such as having had a heart attack or a, a diabetes. But we also have to look at, is the shoulder stiff? Shoulder has lost passive range. Could be a frozen shoulder, particularly if external rotation is less than 45 degrees. But we have to consider osteoarthritis. Is it a locked dislocation, which would be very apparent in the history, and very, very rarely osteocoma. And we'll talk about those because that certainly is a red flag condition. We want to look at are they hypermobile, which leads them at greater risk. And we're talking about generalised hypermobility because that will leave them vulnerable to instability, which means that they're much more prone to ligamentous injuries. Soft tissue assessment, we should be palpating the cuff and its muscles and the bursae around that too. Functional outcome measures are critical. Um, you can either use the SPARTI, Shoulder Pain and Disability Index, or the DASH. Both of those are highly reliable. I actually prefer SPARTI, and I think SPARTI has been tested in many languages now. And the Shoulder Pain and Disability Index is a fantastic way to measure progress with your patients. Every, I usually do it every four weeks. I get my patients to fill out a SPARTI and then do a, a, another review in four weeks and we review their score and see where it's changed. And obviously if it hasn't changed, I need to change my treatment. Um, but it's a great way of measuring that progress. Really important, as we discussed with most musculoskeletal disorders, is that the psychosocial factors are far more valid and important to test than physical. So let's talk about those related to shoulder. Poor self-efficacy efficacy is the number one um, variable that is associated with poor outcomes with shoulder problems. Number one. And what does that mean? I mean, that's a hard word in English, let alone in a second language. What that means is a person's self-belief of whether you can help them or not. Henry Ford, who is a very, who makes who made Ford motor cars, um, he's not a, obviously a physiotherapist or a doctor, but he, he said a very famous quote, and I'd love to quote this now because it's very true with this. And it is whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, either way you're right. Now, what does that mean? What it means is, is basically if a person doesn't believe you can help them, you're probably not going to help them. Conversely, if a person feels you're going to help them, you often will. So it's really important to find out if they feel they're going to progress and if they feel they can help control this. Other poor outcomes associated with two comorbidities or greater than two comorbidities. So let's say, for example, they uh, also suffer from hypertension and they suffer are diabetic. That leads to greater poor outcomes. Their level of education is a very close correlation with outcomes. And if it's lasted more than a year, it's obviously now becoming quite persistent. So here's something that um, you might hear from your patients. I've got a rotator cuff tear. You can't help. 
And as has been said in some research, are wrong. And this is by Dan et al. And they, these questions have found that. We can help it. A rotator cuff tear, definitely we can help. But if they believe you can't help, they're correct. Um, I need an operation. I've been told there's no choice. Physiotherapy won't work. That's wrong again, but they're correct. If they say you can't help, you probably can't, which is what I said before. And um, really important to be careful of the words. Now, I'm not going to be going through this again. If I, if you ask me back and we have more time, I'm happy to go into much more detail with that because it's a fascinating question. I'm going to flick through these for time. But I want to talk about a very famous study uh, done by Suarez Almazor. Uh, it's 10 years old now, but it's still valid. And there are so many other studies which have given us fairly similar um, findings. So it's about knees, but it highlights a person's belief that, and also what you believe, really important if you believe you can help the patient. Because the expectations of recovery are modifiable. So a very famous study, they had 560 people in the study who had osteoarthritis in the knee. Out of that, they were, there was 140 in four different groups. One group had um, sham acupuncture. And, and another 140 had, uh, sorry, sham acupuncture. So I'll start again. 280 had sham acupuncture, 280 had acupuncture in the correct spots for knee osteoarthritis. With the sham group, they were then divided, subdivided into two groups. So we had 140 had sham acupuncture, where the physiotherapist said to the patient, I am very confident I can help you. I've had a lot of success in the past. And the other 100 and four sham group were told, look, we'll give it a chance. We'll, I'll try and help you with this. I don't know if it's going to help, but well, let's give it a try. Then we had the 280 in the acupuncture group. One, they were subdivided again into 140. One group were told, I had a lot of success and I'm sure in your case we can help you. Just like the sham, half of the sham group were told, were told, and the other half in the acupuncture group were told the same negative message that the sham people got, which was, I don't know if I can help you, but let's give it a try. And what the interesting result of that study was, it didn't matter whether the, the physiotherapist put the needles in the right spots or the sham spots. What determined the success of a treatment was not where the needles were placed, rather the positive outcome that you, the message you gave. So the message is really critical. If you don't believe in what you're doing, if you do, you, you're not going to get a great outcome. If you believe strongly that you can help them and you can portray that message to your patient, you can make a difference. Really important point there. So what is the best treatment? I'm flicking through as to say, we've got 45 minutes and we're well into it. So you don't tell your client today's treatment is going to be your third best option. You want to give your client your best option. See, we don't say that. The best option for non-traumatic shoulders is exercise therapy. Now, there is there's a new study I just saw today, but there is absolutely re-emphasizing this. This is the largest study showing that Exercise therapy for the shoulder is the best treatment, and when added with manual therapy, adds even more power. Manual therapy has a great place for shoulder pain in reducing symptoms to allow exercise to be more effective. On its own, <clears throat> manual therapy's effects are limited, but when combined with exercise therapy, it is magic. It's the best treatment. It's better than any treatment out there at the moment, surgical or non-surgical, and we're far cheaper than surgery. So what do we do in the physical examination? So observation, we look at the cervical spine, I've talked about that, C4 to 7, thoracic spine, T1 to 5, a quick palpation of the abdomen to check for the spleen and the gallbladder. We look at range of motion, particularly internal rotation and, and internal rotation and external rotation in neutral. Upper limb tension tests, so your neurodynamic tests. So many physiotherapists forget neurodynamics related to shoulders. It's really critical you do a neurodynamic test. It may need to be modified 
because we're going to get to 110 degrees abduction. But you still should do a modified, at the very least, neurodynamic test. Test for posterior shoulder tightness. Test palpation. Test strength. But don't assume that strength, you can localise it to a specific tendon. You can't. And we'll go through a special test, but one of the biggest ones is symptom modification, which Jeremy Lewis and Chris would attest to, which is probably going to be out of our time today. Observations. We look for atrophy. We look for muscle wasting. Because one of the other what differential diagnoses with um, rotator cuff pain is actually suprascapular nerve entrapment. Now, that can occur and that is associated always with atrophy. But you're looking for atrophy, particularly if it's ongoing. You're checking temperature. You're looking for lumps and bumps, which are not motile. They're immobile. If they're immobile and they're different to the other side, that may be a sign of osteosarcoma. Obviously, you would have done a subjective examination where you would have asked questions that would have strengthened that, such as loss of weight, night sweats, lethargy. All of those are associated with tumours early on, particularly primaries. The neck and the thorax. I prefer Maitland. I got taught by Jeff Maitland himself, but I had the fortune of also being taught by Brian Mulligan as well. Um, I use all those techniques, um, but I'm a massive, I mean, I was trained in Jeff Maitland's approach. I've taught that at master's level, so it's my favourite, but I do love the Mulligan approach if you prefer that. They're both fantastic approaches. You assess C4 to 7, T1 to 5. And as I said before, if you want to find out if the neck or the thorax are involved, it's one thing to find that they've got joint signs, but you treat the joints and then reassess their worst movement. The Littlewood approach, well, we, again, we may not get to that, but it is um, really quickly how he looks at the approach is what is commonly uh, Robin McKenzie's approach was. Now, I'm not a McKenzie therapist, but I do, uh, Chris Littlewood does use this approach, which is a McKenzie approach, and it's a very useful touch approach to see where the cervical spine is involved. He doesn't do Maitland or Mulligan. He uses the McKenzie approach, and what do you get people to do? is you'll get them to retract their neck over pressure, excuse me for the triple chin, hold it for 10 seconds, and then relax. He'll repeat three times, and then he'll reassess their shoulder movement. Now, with that approach, it's not just another way of mobilising the cervical spine. Assess their worst movement. Let's say it's that shoulder movement again, or let's say it's hand behind the back. They're struggling to, to get their hand behind the back. Find the limitate what point they lose that movement. Do your retraction three times for 10 seconds and then reassess. And if that's changed dramatically, then you know that the cervical spine's involved and that becomes the first exercise. Second point is that it doesn't help. You then do low extension with upper flexion. So you get them to upper flex and to extend and then do over pressure. So which will really bias the low cervical spine. Step three. Before you move on, like if you think, is the neck involved? If retraction hasn't been effective, try low extension with upper flexion. If that hasn't been effective, look at lateral flexion. Just look at lateral flexion away, which is going to mobilize muscles more. Look at effect of repetitive lateral flexion away or towards to see whether that has an effect on their shoulder movement. So test the shoulder movement, do these exercises, then reassess straight after and see if there's a change. If there's a significant change, you know that that's a that cervical spine, spinal spine is involved, and you now have an exercise to start to give that patient to take it home. <clears throat> Look at deep neck flexor control. Um, as I said before, we know that improving deep neck flexor control has a direct effect on shoulder function. We also know that power of resisted flexion, extension, rotations, lateral flexion, isometrics to assess the power and address those if that's an issue because we know there is a significant link between neck function and shoulder pain in athletes. And improving neck function improves shoulder pain. We've talked about palpation. Screening tests, remember I said 54% of a test, for example, comes from 
the lumbar spine and the lower limbs. So you should be looking at their ability to lunge, sit to stand, do deep squats, bridges, sit-ups, single leg standing, heel raises. All of these help you predict see whether they, if there is a diminution compared to the normal population for that patient, it may very well be that this becomes part of your rehabilitation for this problem with their shoulder. Let's talk about special orthopedic tests. We talk about empty can and full can. They don't selectively, active supraspina act selectively activate supraspinatus. I know physiotherapists say it, though they do, they do not. The research says they do not. They do selectively look, load up the cuff, but not supraspinatus. So they're sensitive, but they're not specific. So that's really important. Sensitive, that is, um, I hope that makes sense to you. That's how many currently it identifies pain and pathology, where it's not specific is those that it doesn't, a proportion of people without shoulder pain or without pathology that it correctly identifies. So they're sensitive. So they'll tell you if it's a cuff problem, but it's not specific. It won't tell you what it is. It's far better to use a functional test because it's more meaningful for a patient. So if they say I've got a problem where I pour a kettle or when I'm painting or when I try and do it my bra if you're a female or to tuck my shirt in if you're a male, then use that as your functional test and use that for your test retest because that's going to have much more value for your patient too. Radiology. I want to talk about radiology because I think it's a fascinating topic. So really important to understand there are lots of false positives with radiology and you must not rely on radiology because you will test and you'll find things which are quite normal. So here's an, one interesting study on using ultrasound. 40, 70 year olds, 96% of those people that have never had pain, asymptomatic, have shoulder abnormality. So in a population nearly of 40 to 70 year olds of 51, of 51 of them, nearly every one of them have abnormalities on ultrasound. 78% had subacromial bursitis. 65% of those, no shoulder pain ever. So two out of three had AC joint osteoarthritis. 39% of them had a supraspinatus tendinopathy. 22%, so one in five of these people, of these males, had a partial tear of their supraspinatus and yet never have had pain. And so if you give, the thing is if the patient comes in with the ultrasound and they, and you can already see people who are symptom free have tears, you can see that issue why you don't, shouldn't just function on, uh, determine whether you, the person, you should not treat based on whether they have tears or not on, on radiology because it may not even fit their problem. MRIs, they looked at a picture group in America, uh, baseball pictures. About 14 pictures had rotated cuff changes and had tears of the lapram, but not one had a functional problem. So they had no symptoms. They did this and they found they had changes in the cuff and label tears. The biggest predictor of rotated cuff tear is getting older. The older you get, the more likely you have a tear. Um, and so many have shoulder symptoms surgery, sorry, on shoulder tissues that aren't related to their symptoms because they rely on radiology. If you rely on radiology, you might even have surgery on, a, on something which is even a problem, which is a scary thing, a scary thought. Jeremy Lewis's view on posture, different to mine, he actually, but he's done research to show this, that static assessment creates yellow flags. And what I mean by that is the more you watch over somebody's posture and tell them what you're finding, the more you create fear. And he believes that only movement is more critical than static posture. And in fact, he said there's no, in his research, there's no evidence to support scapular postures at all with subacromial impingement, whether it's laterally rotated, um, forward rotated. There's no evidence to say that one particular posture is more correlated with subacromial impingement. Um, so really another interesting point. So just so you know, we can't clinically differentiate. Imaging doesn't usually confirm. It's useful as an add-on, but it's certainly not, should not be on its own ever diagnostic, given that so many people have false positives. And posture doesn't follow defined patterns. 
So that's where Jeremy Lewis came to symptom modification, which is, a, I know Jeremy Lewis is running a lot of courses now in India, which is fantastic. Um, and if you get a chance to hear one of his courses, I would thoroughly recommend it. Um, now, he has basically said, when you use symptom modification to guide your treatment, that is, if you can reduce symptoms with a change in the shoulder, then 68% of those who actually go through his program do extremely well, which is a really good outcome. Now, he's not sure why. As Peter O'Sullivan, another famous researcher, believes, if you can show somebody that slight change in your scapular position, a slight change in your sternal position, a slight uh, anterior drawer of your head of the humerus, whatever it is that actually suddenly changes their aggravating activity to become less painful, is less if it becomes less painful, you're challenging the brain that movement is painful because that's often the biggest driver of their pain. <clears throat> I'm going to move on because there's lots of symptom modifications. But I want to finish off with what treatment is evidence-based. So a summary. Firstly, coming back to what I said before, try and get somebody to work below 90 degrees. Secondly, use a whole body. Don't just focus on the shoulder. Look at neck function. Look at the cervical spine joints. Look at the thoracic spine. Look at the trunk. Is there motor control issues in the trunk? Look at their strength of their, both their lumbar spine, but also their lower limbs. Should, uh, you should look at using specific rehabilitation, cuff rehabilitation and scapular humeral rehabilitation using the symptom modification Lewis approach or the Lewis approach. Manual therapy, so your joint mobilisation of the glenohumeral joint or the AC joint, if there is loss of mobility, can be really useful. Soft tissue massage for the affected muscles. Stretching the posterior capsule of the shoulder, if, it is, if there is a loss of range in the, for the posterior capsule, can be absolutely invaluable. But understand all those manual therapy approaches are not very effective on their own. But when they're combined with specific exercise using either the Lewis approach or the Littlewood approach, little approach then you can get fantastic results and the research is very supportive of that don't forget the neck and thorax for joints don't forget neurodynamics as well so i think that's probably it because we've got just under over 10 minutes left um just excuse me i don't know whether you just go right. back I'm just going to go back to where I was to start with, and I'm not sure if this way we're able to uh, look at slot. Uh, uh, there is a is there a way using this? Software? You can you can share the slide again. You can, you can share the slide again if you want to. Otherwise, we can start with the questions, sir. Yeah. Were there any questions? Because I, I can keep going, but if there's any questions, yeah. I'm happy yes, to yes, yes, do yes. that now. Yeah. So the first question uh, from uh, people are. Uh, how to get the super spirit and spend it? Okay. So that that would be with so just answering that question, the you can either use the the you can either use either of those approaches, the Lewis approach or the Littlewood approach, or any other approach. These these two have got strong evidence. So bottom line is what I would do. I'll teach you the, I'll show you the Littlewood approach because that's the simplest one. It's the most simple approach to strengthen the cuff. <clears throat> the Jeremy Lewis approach is very detailed and certainly isn't conducive for a five minute conversation. But the Littlewood approach is. So with the Littlewood, with the Littlewood approach, firstly you would use their primary aggravator. So let's say their primary aggravator is reaching. What you would then do is you would you're aiming to be as functional as you can. So you, your aim is eventually to get them to a point where if they're getting their pain over their head, painting, that's where you want to build strength. But you start from a point of control. So how to strengthen the cuff is once you've addressed the cervical spine, you would then come in with really simple approach, Chris Littlewood, with TheraBand. Now, what you would do is you would see which movement with the TheraBand gives them the most improvement in their function. So you would test before, get a piece of TheraBand, usually start with very low load, such as yellow, 0 to 30 degrees, and you would try 
you're just thinking about that movement would involve a combination of external rotation and abduction. So what I would do is I do abduction. So I haven't got a theraband here, but you imagine the theraband's here. Holding at one side, going out to 30 degrees external rotation. Very simple. This is the simplest way. Do 10 repetitions. Then get them to reassess that movement after. Now, if that has changed their symptoms, modified their symptoms, and it's made a significant difference, then that becomes their exercise. If there is not much change, you would go back again and do abduction. So try, rather than external rotation, you would then try abduction to 30 degrees, zero to 30 degrees abduction, and then reassess their movement. Usually one of those two, whether it's abduction or external rotation, will give you the maximum improvement before and after. And that becomes your exercise. And one of the other keys with rehabilitating, whether it's supraspinatus or any other part of the cuff, is that you don't load them too quickly. So you'd start them with that and then see them in a couple of weeks and upgrade that exercise. Now, remember, if this, if this, you have to relate it to function. So I can't give you a recipe for each individual, but I can give you an example. Like if somebody says they get pain when they paint, working down here, like we did with rehabilitation, is only going to help so much. You want to get them up into elevation. So what you would do if external rotation was, was good, was their number one exercise, you would get them now starting in, a, in abduction and do external rotation. And you'd be progressing higher and higher from 30 degrees to 60 degrees to 90 degrees abduction, and then up to 120 degrees abduction. So you'd be going every time you see them, you'd be progressing their exercise towards that functional movement. And when you get to that range that they need to work in, only then should you build the load. Then going from yellow theraband to green to red, sorry, to red to green, so on. Where you stop is when the patient becomes symptom free for, for at least a month. Now, it's really important you tell your patients it is going to take three months to get a recovery. Shoulder problems do not settle very quickly. If you overload too quickly, the tendons will fight back by causing pain. Tendons do not need graduated loading. They will not cope with a sudden increase. And that is why you need to see them and build that exercise up towards that point and not do it very quickly like this. So I hope that gives you one example. There's lots of other approaches. That approach is the Littlewood approach and it is highly effective. And you couldn't get a more simpler approach when you start to your shoulders. All right, that was really great. So we have another question. Uh, how to treat the unleveled shoulder or uneven shoulder? I'm not sure even what there is. What's an uneven shoulder? Do we mean shoulder like this? Yeah, yeah. Unleveled. It means unleveled shoulder. Well, I, I don't. It's not something you treat a problem. So what I mean by that is people all have different variants of of normality. Unless it's affecting them, unless they're actually getting pain. As a result of that, I don't treat the unevenness, I treat the symptoms. So you, don't, you just don't see anybody come in to Australia saying, can you treat my uneven shoulder? Because that, it, it's not a, it's, it, it's, I'd ask them, so how's that affecting you? Yeah. And, 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 and the next thing I'd add to that is unevenness may not be from the shoulder anyway, it could be scoliosis. Yeah, you, you can't, you, you, on its own, I don't say this is how I treat an uneven shoulder. I have to look what, what is the problem that it's causing and can I change it? If it's a structural change like a scoliosis, I'm, I might scoliosis, I may need to be able to give some minor changes with exercise. So it's a very hard question to answer because it's a very broad comment. But I've never, to be honest, in all my years as a clinician, 30 years, I've never seen somebody come in because their shoulders are uneven. It's because, look, I'm getting pain, and then I observe that their shoulders might be uneven. But I don't focus on the unevenness. I focus on the weaknesses and strengths. That's perfect. So we have another question coming here. Let's suggest, can you please enlighten us uh, regarding sham cupping for the patients, or is it like uh, the vacuum cupping? Uh, are they referring, do you think they're referring to the research that I was talking about with the needles? Probably, yes, yes. Okay, so it wasn't cupping, it was needles. So they were All doing right. sham needles versus acupuncture in the, in the, 
acupuncture in the actual um, correct spots for osteoarthritis of the knee versus sham spots. So sham spots, they were putting them randomly anywhere in the research, but places that shouldn't have any effect on the knee. But I would probably say if they did the same research using cupping, they'd get exactly the same result. It's the, the key message there was, it's not the procedure, it's not the technique, which is the neat which is the needles, it's the power of the messages you give your patients have a profound effect. If you believe it will help, you'll have a profound effect on a patient. If you don't believe it's going to help, it won't. All right. We have another question coming up here. Is, so what does the repeating figure pain at the clinical hip joint can suggest? So I'm not sure what that actually means. Are you able to <laughs> translate the meaning of that for me, Hamansha? Uh, they, they are saying that uh, the pain coming out of the trigger points, if there is a repeatedly, the pain is coming repeatedly at the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint specifically, or the, around that glenohumeral joint, what it could suggest of? Okay. So, I mean, trigger points are just areas of muscle tightness. Um, if, if they're getting, it depends where they're getting it around their shoulder. Now, if it's lateral anterior shoulder, it's probably rotator cuff dysfunction. Whether it's tendinopathy or a tear, it's 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 really not that. Uh, it would indicate that it's probably dysfunction of the cuff, but it, but of course, you know, a lot of other trigger points which they may be alluding to may be related to overactivity and substitution of other muscles such as the upper trapezius, levator scapula, the rhomboids. All those muscles often develop over at hypertonicity, hypertonic points such as trigger points, which which are usually indicative of rotator cuff dysfunction. So what I would always look at is I would still do the manual therapy. I'd still do the soft tissue work or, or acupuncture on those muscles. But if it keeps recurring, repeating, which is what I think they're talking about, that would tell me that there's probably more an underlying cuff dysfunction and these muscles are, are actually being overworked because of cuff weakness. So rather than just keeping on in a loop, just treating that soft tissue dysfunction, the trigger points, I would then need to implement a cuff rehab program as well to address the underlying problem. All right, we had the, another question also, which was also almost quite similar to that. Uh, the, uh, it's suggested with the treatment of the trigger points near the joint, the near the joint. So that is uh, the same thing that you have answered. Yeah, look, so progressing treatment, so progressing, yeah. whether it's near the joint or away from the joint makes no difference. So progressing, so how I progress treatment is I progress rehabilitation, as I said in that first one, if you use the Littlewood approach, progress towards their mid limit. So just to give you a different example, let's say it is hand behind the back, which is often a common one then you would actually work further and further into internal rotation behind the back with your, rehab, with your rehabilitation. And with your manual therapy, then you would just keep progressing. So if let's say I was treating trigger points and the person's main problem was getting their hand behind the back. Let's say, like I said, with a lady, it was hard to put on a bra and that was her functional limit. That was her biggest issue. Then I would start her in neutral. I'd do my trigger points. And if she was progressing well, I'd be doing my rehabilitation of the cuff. But also, as, as she's getting better, I'd be doing my trigger points therapy, but more and more into internal rotation. I would increasingly, every visit, get her hand further up her back and then do the trigger points because I'd be pushing her more towards her physiological limitation. So rather than just doing it in neutral position, her trigger points, aim to go more and more into her functional limitation. So every visit, put her more and more into internal rotation. All right. Okay. So we have a case now. Uh, there's a patient who's uh, suggesting that he had an injury in 2011 while throwing ball while playing cricket. And to add on, uh, he also says that uh, uh, the shoulder and elbow feels weak as uh, the patient tries to lift some weight and perform some exercise in gym. And uh, okay. this one is, uh, it was in 2011 when he tried to throw a ball while playing cricket. So there was a pop-up sound along with an injury. After that, it was a painful shoulder. Okay. So, I mean, on that alone, it's very hard. I can only give rough ideas like obviously without a history without an examination <laughs> i can only give a rough approximation exactly. so exactly. if if it was and it really depends if it was on the cock in the cocking phase 
when you're about to throw the ball, then yeah. it could be it could be a slap lesion, it could be a ligament. Um, so it could be it, the other two that I'd be thinking of in that position, and both of those, unless there's adequate rehabilitation, may persist. I mean, slap lesions are relatively avascular, so they are notorious to not completely settle. If there is a ligamentous instability, like such as even a subluxation in that position, then um, you know that could have been left, if not treated correctly and rehabilitated correctly, might be leaving you vulnerable. But it also could be on the deceleration phase. So it's really hard without knowing more. If it's on the deceleration phase, it would make me think of biceps tendinopathy. Uh, because biceps is our major muscle which has to accelerate our elbow yes, at a yes. very fast rate when we're following through with a throw. Uh, and I'm assuming we're talking about a, a, a throw from the outfield in cricket, I'm assuming we're talking about. So that is a really common presentation with somebody who's got a biceps tendinopathy as well. I, I, that, it's really hard for me to say which one it could be. So it could be, wrong. It could be a, a ligamentous yeah. or it could be a deceleration uh, biceps tendinopathy, particularly assuming that if he was playing cricket, he's relatively young. Um, those are the three that I emphasize. Then I'd obviously have to do ligament testing. I'd do your anterior stability, posterior stability, inferior sulcus test to test for least stability. I'd be testing for bicep control in deceleration. And I'd be looking, asking more questions. If you got a clunk every time with movement, if the pain was very specific, it would make me think more and more of a slap lesion. Unfortunately, slap lesions are very hard to diagnose from clinical testing. They're yeah. more from history. Um, yeah. There's a lot of tests which they hypothesize load the, um, the, uh, the slap lesion up more, particularly active O'Brien's in 20 degrees A deduction, but it is unreliable. It's really history with a clunk, repetitive click, very specific pain. The only really standard test we have at the moment for that is um, MRI with contrast dye where we see a leak in the inferior glenoid. But even that isn't that reliable. We can see, you, we've seen patients, because I work very closely with the shoulder surgeon, uh, sports that it works very high with uh, cricketers and we've seen patients who don't have the his have a history but their physical examination isn't clear MRI is negative not and when we in the surgeon does an arthroscopy they have a massive tear in their glenoid so it's not always a uh, hundred percent even with MRI so, so to answer your question it's very hard to say it could be what it could be but it would, to me it would say it's one of those three ligamentous instability that has been poorly rehabilitated an ongoing um slap lesion that hasn't been rehabilitated correctly or possibly a biceps tendinopathy all three of them prop it means that, that you probably need better rehabilitation yeah okay we have a similar question that what can we do about any shoulder subluxations Best treatment for subluxation um, is usually, uh, if it's just subluxing, if it's not recurrent and there's no sign of damage to the axillary nerve, which is obviously something you have to be careful of with recurrent subluxation, is exercise therapy, is working on control, um, working very much on control into external rotation and abduction. Um, in loaded positions, usually subluxations and abduction, external rotation, as you know. So a lot of it will be control. Taping gives a really good immediate relief, but it's obviously not curative. You need to work on rehabilitation. So a lot of cuff rehabilitation, but in functional positions again. It, um, sadly, if, it's, if that is not enough, but not very often, most of the time, cuff rehabilitation, very functionally aimed at their positions, of instability is what's going to be giving you the best results for subluxation. So there's there's a question from my side also. Uh, ever since the world, the whole rehab world is going for a biopsychosocial model of rehabilitation these days. So how can we employ? Although you have talked about the psycho psychological module of uh, or the role of psychological employment in uh, rehabilitation, then how can we employ the biopsychosocial module in cuff repair conditions when the patient comes in acute phases with us? Yeah. So the that that comes back to firstly identifying their beliefs. So uh, applying the, if I can just say BPS for short, biopsychosocial, BPS is much easier to say, is really, 
is really working with that person. Setting goals is really critical. The best way to get a great result with your clients, adopting the BPS approach, is to address all three parts, the bio, the psycho, the social. And so knowing their goals, matching your treatment for their goals, and actually identifying any barriers to their recovery. Now, most of those barriers are the, not the bio, they're the psychosocial. So asking the patient, what do you think is wrong with you? What do you understand is wrong with you? And if those, if they say things which are aberrant or are fear driving, like I, I think I've got this massive tear, I don't think you can help, is actually talking to them about the evidence. Talk to them about, well, the evidence is the, that torn tendons, even if it is a tear, tear in the tendon, the best treatment remains physiotherapy, particularly if it's related to the exercise rehabilitation. And actually seeing and talking to them about that, educating them about how the recovery is, telling them it's going to take time, because that's another critical part. The other part is actually setting, setting the scene very early, saying this is going to take up to 12 weeks and looking for their response. That's what, and, and actually working with them, educating them the whole time. Biopsychosocial really is actually engaging with your patient and ensuring you're both agreeing to the same goals and you both are understanding that the outcome is the same. Because if a patient believes they're going to get better in two weeks and that's not reality-based, you're going you're gonna to just cause more, stra more stress, more anger, when they don't get to that point, if you haven't said, if you haven't told them it's going to take far longer than that, then you're go then you're going to get frustration, distress, anxiety when they don't achieve their goals. So it's really important to set those and to keep setting goals, little goals, all the time. <clears throat> so rather than just saying, "Okay, you want to get back and throw the ball well in cricket," well, let's first thing let's let you be able to throw the ball just here, just small throws. Would that be a good step? Or if you could actually sleep through the night, let's say they're having problems sleeping at night, getting you to be able to sleep during the night, would that be a good fit? So setting little micro goals with a long-term goal in the future is a really good way of addressing the person's beliefs. But bottom line, as I said before, and it is so true, if a patient doesn't think you can help them, if they truly don't believe it can help them, even after you've educated them, it's going to be a big challenge. A big challenge and it may be that they'll be on physiotherapy only because they believe that so not that it's true but if a person believes that it's very hard to change now i'm just aware of the time i have patience in a few minutes so i'll have to leave very soon thank you, thank you so much for that's right you. so look um, i will say that that was only a very small part of my presentation if if there's interest and Dr. Hermanshi can let us know, um, then I'll then I'm happy to consider coming back. It's just down to whether this was of use for oh. you all. So I hope I hope um, it was a interesting hour, um, and I wish you all the best. I hope you're all safe and healthy in this wide epidemic and pandemic, and I hope we all can perhaps visit each other one day when it's a lot safer. All the best uh, for inviting me, Dr. Hermanshi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Goodbye. Thank you so much. <laughs> all the best to all of you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. It was great Thank you. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.